each of these 25 cups in my current exhibition um, represent a different time, a different technique, a different place in the world. When talking about stoneware, we have about, well, at least 3,000 years of history. Um, most of that not in Europe, though. Uh, yeah. So I'll try to tell you a little bit about each of these cups now. Let's start. So, this cup. It's a dark stoneware clay. It's anagamma fired. Anagamma is a kiln type that has roots way back into history. Um, wood fired, and this pot is fired for four days. But it hasn't seen a lot of the flame though, a lot of the fire, because it's been fired inside a sagar. A sagar is more or less a clay container where I put this cup and its friends in. And I wrapped each one of them into uh, with straw and then fired them. So instead of making the flame from the large fire affect the pots, it's the smoldering parts of organic material that makes all the colorings. So for instance, you have this line here where you even can imagine the, imagine the straw and this scorch mark where it's turned into a glaze and this red base where it's clearly happened something different from here and this dark patch here. I like the shape of this one rather firmly on, on the it sits firmly on the tabletop with a small 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 foot making it hover just a bit over making a soft shadow underneath and I, I like that feel delicate feel so when talking about anagamma fired pots pots that have uh, been fired for many days sometimes using as much as uh, 25 cubic meters of wood and that's uh, roughly what a house would use in one one and a half year to heat itself uh, the clay and glaze effects uh, gets changed a lot during the time so with an anagamma fired pot you'll usually see at least two sides one side uh, that's been facing the fire during the process and one side that's been facing the chimney so to speak so in this case this is the fire side and it's been the chimney side so on the fire side we have a higher temperature a lot more flame and specifically a lot more ash that sticks to the pot and reacts with the glaze or actually the vitreous slip in this case that turns into a glaze with the help of ash and starts to pour down the side here. This is a fairly light stoneware clay and a vitreous slip on top on the inside and up to this point. You can see how the flame has moved through the kiln making a flowing pattern turning the clay bluish and reaching down a little bit into the cup here on the inside but not all the way down so have all these effects there, all the way around the pot so um, when talking about vitreous slips I've found that these are interesting to work with because as you fire the kiln you actually add an element to them turning them sometimes into a glaze and sometimes leaving them more or less like a clay so this is another example with the chimney side and the front facing the fire and you can see how it turned the vitreous slip into a glaze and it started to pour down making a small droplet that actually made this pot stick to the shelf so I had to break it loose 
telling a clear story of the kiln's harshness, more or less. On the backside here, you also have some gold and crystals created during a deduction fired cooling, turning them just this color. Mm. This cup is not fired in an Anagama kiln, but another wood-fired kiln. A lot shorter time, not four days or five days, but ten or twelve hours. It's made on the wheel. Um, two clays mixed, but actually it's one clay. We're taking a part away and added a little bit of stain, cobalt in this case. And then not wedging those two clays together completely, just putting them together on the wheel head. And while turning it, they will spiral up like this. As you can see. You can actually see on the base here where I've trimmed out the base. You see more or less how it looks like before turning, so to speak. How the ball or clay I put on there looked. It's been fired in a stack and um, that makes the inside untouched by flame as you can see and you see a intermediate area where it's turned orange and as one of these cups has been, has been underneath here it's also shielded the side as you can see quite clearly making an interesting effect. This blue color it's not from cobalt as this though, it's from the flame reducing the clay so heavily that it turns blue during the firing. I think I would like to drink something clear from this cup. This is also a vitreous slip on top of a dark stoneware clay, fired in a wood kiln but with salt. So when firing with salt you throw salt into the kiln and it, it will react with the clay. As it won't stay salt as we know it, it will become a salt fume that flows through the kiln and reacts with the clay. This is the front side where a lot of salt has hit and you can see it looks one way here and differently all the way around. It's turned and thrown and I've done a small wavy line all the way around to catch the flowing slip as it's turning into a glaze and making this rather nice pattern here. If you look closely you can see small crystals created during the cooling of the firing. About a thousand degrees Celsius or so. Um, this pot was only grey or greyish and you can see that underneath here. But these crystals started to evolve as oxygen entered the kiln, turning the kilns and the crystals not grey but yellow, goldenly green. It's been fired on three wadding uh, balls and that's just a very refractory uh, clay rolled into balls and put on the feet here and put on the shelf in the kiln because in, in a salt firing every piece of clay becomes sticky and glazed so you'll have a hard time removing the pot if you don't use waddings of some sort I want my cups to have the feel that someone has cared about them, that someone has taken care of them throughout the process, nurturing them more or less. Um, 
and sending it along to people who continue caring about them is something that's important for me. <laughs> I'm looking at a pot fired in a wood kiln. You can turn it all the way around, seeing the two different sides fired towards the chimney or towards the fire. You see a landscape, a change all the way around. I'm making quite a different pot from one side to the next. Um, leaving room for development in the viewer, for instance. Sometimes you might like one side and it might change to another side before the story is over, so to speak. This pot has been fired in an anagama kiln for four days. It's a dark stoneware clay with a porcelain slip slipped quite loosely to this line. This form is thrown, but I've trimmed out the foot and also trimmed a little bit up here, as you can see. So you have a kind of soft feel here, a little bit harder here where I've trimmed out the foot. You can see clearly how this has been reduction cool as the clay is quite black. Um, and you can see the sprinkles of ash inside the pot as the heavy ash has fallen down into it. And that tells me that this pot has been quite much in the front of the kiln where this heavy, heavy ash still flies with the flame through the kiln. This ash won't reach the back end of the kiln. So, uh, in the back of the Anagama kiln, I usually make some glazed pots. Um, I find the glaze when fired for a so, so long time with a lot of extra um, deposits on it through the flame, through the ash that reaches it, which can change quite a lot and make something very interesting. So this um, cup is a dark stoneware with an ash glaze, glazed to this point, and I sweep with my finger away around here to make that meeting between glazed and unglazed a little bit wavy and less hard. Uh, ash glaze is very thin, so it kind of mottly looking differently all the way around, as you can see. Uh, I have a large iron speck here as iron has moved out through the clay into the clay space. I've done a small trimming out of the foot here. Um, Actually, it's not needed because the feel of the pot, I want it to stand quite firmly onto the tabletop and looking like it's sprouting out like a flower through the earth. With this type of shape as well. But I trimmed out the base because I, I feel the base needs some attention. Um, all along the line that I want to give attention to the pot and uh, you might store your pots, the cups into the cabinet um, upside down and you see that uh, or you'll wash them out after using them and you'll see this it will be um, something extra I like that so make uh, pots or cups in every technique I can find. So this is a, a small cup fired in an in a electric kiln. It's a light stoneware clay with quite a lot of sand in it. So you can see a large sand particle uh, flowing out here. Then there's, I've actually dipped this cup into a, a earthenware glaze, or earthenware slip 
that's turned into a glaze at these temperatures and then a clear glaze on top of that. And this earthenware glaze will make the clear glaze flow quite a lot. So I've done these rims, indentations and lines on the inside to collect that and pool it, making a decorative effect of the natural flowing of the glaze. So, <clears throat> when talking about bases, I think this one is special as well. It doesn't have a clear definition of a base either, so it's quite similar in shape, um, in shaping this tulip shape or what, what you want to call it. It's a light stonework clay fired in an anagama kiln, a bit of vitreous slip on top, and you can see how I slip the pot because I put one finger here and um, three fingers here and I poured inside, poured out and dipped it and then I've actually blown with my, uh, like this so I moved a little bit of the excess away here and I've blown at the base as well so here it's very very thin so you can see this is the clay color but this is the clay when you have a little bit of this vitreous slip on top and it's turned this clear brown and I like that because the foot is so mm, subtle uh, in the meeting towards the outer shape but with, the, but with this brown color it's, it pops out or pops in even you see this nice meeting here I like to feel when picking this cup up because I have to be quite delicate as it's kind of wide and if it's filled with something you have to be stable. Mm. Yeah. So this cup there is uh, something you see all around the world actually to great perfection tr throughout history I would say it's uh, in Britain you call it slipware in Japan you call it kohiki um, in Korea pushyong it's all the same thing in essence it's a dark stoneware clay or a dark clay with a white slip on top and a clear glaze. And with those three elements you can make quite a lot of different effects. This one is um, fired in a salt, wood fired salt kiln. And I've applied the white slip with a brush, you can see the whirl down here. And uh, something special with this cup is over here, you can see a pinkish blush inside the white glaze, a white slip. Yeah. And that's from uh, the whiteness of this clay is quite cold when looking at it. And that's because we reduce this kiln when firing it. So it turns everything cold in color. But during cooling, at some point oxygen entered the kiln again and when reaching the clear glaze it couldn't go through but here I had a small small pinhole in the glaze from the natural parts in the clay and glaze and so on and uh, that made um, that a possible way in for the oxygen and you can see that oxygen and oxygen has actually moved into that pinhole moved under the glaze and affected the slip here, turning it pinkish. But sometimes it's quite a hard effect even where we've done the clay or slip rather blue throughout through the firing and you get these really orange spots on it and it almost looks like a disease. 
So I like this more subtle effect. And it happens just a little bit. Something small to find in your pot uh, over the course of time. As heavy pot has when fired these ways with these organic materials, with these organic techniques, in lack of a better word. In the time of making these 25 cups for this exhibition, uh, it's hard to count how, ma how many cups I've thrown away, because each one of these are the end point of a long study into a technique, into a shape, and uh, getting them intertwined as I want them. Sometimes you get a gem from the kiln, they give something unexpected that actually works, but that's not always the case and nothing you can expect. But uh, happy times when that happens. <laughs> um, usually it's only hard work. <laughs> For instance, this cup, it's a dark stoneware clay, fired in an anagama kiln um, for four days with a thin white slip applied with a brush. You can see the grey or almost blue colour here and uh, more red on the inside here and that's from with the firing where flame has hit this side but not got into the pot. You can also see a white mark on this side and that's from the wadding. This cup has actually been fired on the side. You can see that as well as it's a little bit oval from being at 1300 degrees Celsius for four days or three at least. It's uh, few clays will manage that without any effects and that's kind of nice it's a story in its own and the wadding is very decorative in this pot i put on a large one to give an entire large white speck here this um, pot is fired in an electric kiln and it's a um, study into a tradition of yellow seto in Japan. I don't know how close I am to, to the originals but uh, I really like these results that I get out of it with a white clay, a porcelain slip and a yellow glaze uh, that's clear when thin but motley and unclear when thick. So after glazing this pot you can actually see these lines as cracks in the glaze because where the crack is the glaze will become thinner and you will get this very special look after the firing. So many of these cups are thrown away during the glazing part not even after the firing, so to speak, because I, I see how well the cracks develop. I like the shape here where you get a firm grip. It tells the user how to hold him or her, whichever a cup is. So, I've already shown you a, a grey bluish pot uh, earlier, and this is another one uh, made out of uh, primitive porcelain, um, like the first porcelains in China would look like. So, on the outside, you have the colder color, and on the inside, where the flame hasn't hit have a, almost a yellow tint and on the base here you have something similar and that's because I fired these cups in a stack so I have had made a eight or so of these these and I 
um, put the first cup like this and then put another one on top of that rim against rim and then another cup up like that so foot against foot so that explains why fire hasn't touched inside because it's been closed by another cup and it hasn't touched the inside of the foot because another foot has been on top of that you can clearly see what the flame hasn't have power enough to push, push itself into the crack because it uh, released itself and given this um, reddish halo <clears throat> around the base. I like the foot on this, like a cut like a gemstone, hard and sharp. And it fits the petite size so well. So, during the last firings, I've looked to other techniques in firing the kiln. A little bit more, a little less smoke, at least at parts of the firing. And I started to get these fired pots. They become a little bit more shiny when oxidizing and you get a little bit more of these yellow parts and you get these large ash specks that are yellow that I think they call goma in Japanese um, I like the shape of this pot uh, with a straight line a small curve into a straight foot a little bit beveled here so it lifts a little bit above the tabletop and a small outwards edge making it easy to drink from but also a very sophisticated sophisticated ending to the shape I feel and then a very um, simple firing just honest in its style So, on the other hand, you get firings that are quite dramatic. And this is a cup that represents that style. A uh, dark stone or clay with a vitreous slip on top. Fired in a wood salt kiln. And you can see how differently the that your slip has reacted on different sides depending on reduction, fire, temperature, salt amount, all those things. You can see there are three warding marks, a small, small foot here. And yeah, the connection between the sides and the foot via some cuttings here that I've done during trimming. And I've scraped up a little bit, like a pattern here, to make the edge less hard, in a sense. It's nice how the glaze has pooled during firing, moved downwards, and actually made a couple extra lines, like outlines to the rim, making it very clear where it is. So the rim is darker. You have a light part and dark line once again. When working with these techniques, uh, let's call them primitive in a lack of a better word, um, I try to control every aspect of the process as much as possible. I try to perfect my throwing technique. I read everything I find on glazes and uh, other people's experience with different techniques and so on. I try to control the kiln environment, schedules, wood, how much the wood is split even. To get uh, a feel of control here because I feel the most interesting part for me is when I have a driven intention and that meets uh, the natural thing that is craft, clay, 
and firing. And in that cross section where these parts mix, I find that I found, find the most interesting cups for me. And I've tried to pick those out for you in this exhibition. For instance, this is a primitive porcelain cup with a celadon type glaze on it. It's been fired in a wood kiln with salt in it. And you can see uh, the way around here how salt has affected the pot differently at different parts, depending on how it's hit it. So for instance, on uh, this side here, quite a lot of uh, salt has hit and turned this glaze into a very flowing glaze that's pooled down into this very special foot. I made it specifically for this reason because I needed a large foot to collect all this excess glaze that might start to pool. Um, because with this technique, with this type of glaze, this type of clay and this type of design and shape, I wouldn't feel, it wouldn't feel right if we had a break mark here where glaze has pulled down, it got stuck to the shelf and I had to break it loose. That kind of damage wouldn't feel right here. So. But, on a, but on the other hand, for another pot with another effect, it would be just right. So. But for this one, I had to have this goal in mind, making sacrifices and choices depending on that. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so this cup is a, a rather light stoneware clay fired upside down in an anagama. So you can see it's been glazed on the lower part as well, but not on the inside, making this interesting line on the inside here as the flame has moved in. But since it's been fired in the very front of the kiln, uh, you can see how the flame almost has touched every part of the pot, at least on the back side here. It's almost flown all the way around the pot before releasing and letting go. And in this quite intense atmosphere you have in the front of an anagama kiln, the clay itself has started to be eaten away and you can see impurities in the clay coming forth, like these white, white stones here. Making quite a lively landscape to look at. Opposite to this effect is a more controlled environment like the electric kiln where this has been fired. In that type of atmosphere, the clay won't have its li life on its own in the same way. So I tried to play with that uh, with a dark clay, transparent glaze and a white slip that stands for the life in the pot. Uh, applied. Uh, in a banding here, leaving a small dark line extra here to hyphen the, the rim of the cup. I'm trying to find a, a flowing line that's interesting but not uh, overly done or too conscious. That's uh, art in its own right. So, the next pot I want to show is special in its way that it's a little bit smaller than some of the cups, even though I have this cup next to this that's small as well. I like the feel of this cup because when you pick it up, the smallness make me, may, is making me tender in my grip. And that, that type of personality is very nice against this firing that's kind of on the opposite side. A little bit more stable and rough. 
and its appearance. Fired on the side, like this, with a small pot there on the very edge here as well, shielding this one from, from flame and ash here. I like the shape also, two finger grip, or three finger grips. Hmm. <clears throat> the last cup in this series is a very special glaze type. It's been fired in an anagama kiln. It's a um, rather light clay, uh, lightly colored stoneware clay, and it's a glaze, a vitreous slip on top. You can see it's been reduction cooled because there's no tendency towards white or yellow here, it's just gray. And the entire shape is gray with a little bit of tint of green here and there, especially on the inside. So, this pot tells a very special story from the kiln. During the firing, the entire pot was gray, but during the cooling, in a special part of the kiln, in a special environment, it's almost impossible to create once again. These crystals creating during cooling became white. And that in combination with the thinness of the potting, the foot and the delicate lines here makes the feel of a wild bird's egg quite strong. And I think even though you might, might not be conscious about those connections, it affects how you approach the pot and how you lift it up, making a rather special bond possible. An interesting aspect for me with working with pottery is that it has room for many parts of me. I can be physical, you know, splitting wood, firing for days at an end, wedging clay. But it also has room for the craft part, working with hands, throwing, trimming and so on. Or glazing even. And it can be an art in itself. And uh, it has room for uh, my interest in history, searching through what's been done in pottery and looking for old techniques and so on. And it also has room for my technical side, learning about glaze chemistry, finding and adapting things and learning from mistakes via these knowledges and from all the fields combined into small cups in this case. For instance, this cup, it's a dark stoneware clay and on top of it, it's a clear glaze. But since the dark clay has a lot of iron in it, during the firing process, iron will bubble up into the glaze and mix. And since the glaze is moving at these temperatures, different uh, thickness of the glaze, different temperatures all the way around and different amount of iron, change the coloring of the pot. So iron in reduction can become all the colors of the rainbow but in oxidation you'll have a hard time getting anything else but yellow. So these colors are all from the reduction part of the firing even though reoxidation as it's called is a part as well. In this cup, I've used a, a lightly colored stonework clay, fired in an anagama kiln upside down. Into the clay, I wedged a stone I collected in Denmark a few years back. Small stones that react just right for my taste. 
I've trimmed this bow a little bit, even though I don't have to because it doesn't have a foot in its normal sense. But that's to bring the stone out onto the surface. So you can feel on with your fingers afterwards like this. And on the inside, the stones is just underneath the clay surface, making small, yeah, yeah, very special surface alike. You can see the watering mark here as well, and some lines up from some grass I put in between the watering and the clay to give a little bit of extra life inside the bowl. Uh, the cup. And on the full turn of the pot you have the orange from the back side, the grey blue and some yellow where some extra ash has deposited during oxidation in the kiln. This pot has an honest stable feel for me. And that's something I think it uh, has in common with this uh, cup. The shape is inspired from uh, um, traditional Shino bowls. Uh, those bowls I'm thinking about are Japanese and usually called Chavan and are quite a lot bigger. Um, but they have some shape similarities with this, so it's only an inspirational start straight lines, a small foot that's quite low, kind of hides underneath, making it just hover a bit over the ground, just to make it easy to grip it, pick it up. And this small peaked base is uh, typical for the pot I'm inspired for in this case. But the glaze is not a chino at all, it's something quite different. It's a Glaze that reacts uh, quite easily with wood, and uh, it has done so in this case uh, a lot on the front, but on the back side, where there's no ash at all, it's very mm, yeah, different from the front, which is shiny and glossy. This cup, on the other hand, is quite different from those two. It's thin, with um, a quite high foot and very hard foot, not connected at all with the outer shape, I would say, mm, making it look like a stem, more or less, for the cup instead. It's a, a primitive porcelain with a very thin glaze on top, and you can see the finger marks for me glazing this pot. I've raw glazed it. I, the process of raw glazing is um, when you glaze without a bisque firing. You glaze straight away on, on soft clay or semi-soft clay, what we call leather hard. And for me that's a good process because I can make a cup in two days, not two or three weeks. Uh, so the process is kind of fast and it has to be like that since I have so many different techniques in the air at the same time for me to keep tracks of on things and also it gives a fresh feel to everything and some marks you only see on old pots because they were raw glazed as well and the last cup um, for this set is this one. It's a, an ash glaze on top of a high iron dark stoneware clay fired in an anagama kiln. And the ash glaze is not very thick but during the firing the ash from the wood that we fired the kiln with has mixed with the glaze and it looks like we could glazed quite a lot on this side and this side um, but that's only the wood giving the, that extra. So on the inside here, it's actually started to pool a bit, like a lake down here, with thick, thick ash clays, very green. 
and intense. I like the shape of this one. It has similarities with the um, Chino inspired bowl, but it has an outward rim here. I feel it's more what you see in Jap uh, Chinese bowls, not cups. And a very low belly here, making it sit very um, firmly on the ground. <laughs> 